All right. I have 10 after. Um, hopefully my clock isn't fast or something like that. Um, so our, we're going to start. Um, Evan is going to start us off on this next snippet. Um, and we're going to focus on, on uh, testing evaluation activities. Um, so Evan's put together a nice little summary of um, how we're trying to approach our testing evaluation activities. So take it away, Evan. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, before starting, I want to acknowledge uh, everyone from DTC who contributed results and slides to this presentation. Um, because while I'm the speaker today, uh, this was really a team effort. And I'm going to talk about the importance of hierarchical testing and evaluation in our work. Uh, so please go ahead to the next slide. All right, I, I probably don't need to spend a lot of time convincing this group about why hi hierarchical system development or HSD is important. Uh, the atmosphere is an incredibly complex system. There's a lot of nonlinear interactions between the different physical processes that exist within it. And uh, that tends to cause us to create diagrams like the one on this slide when we're trying to diagram how everyone, everything interacts with each other. And um, you know, if you're trying to figure out you know, why, for example, your modeling system has a bias in near surface temperature, you can see that there's a lot of different possible processes that could be contributing to that. So we need a way to simplify this down and be able to isolate the key processes or components that are contributing to a model bias. And in, in addition to that, you know, 3D model runs are, are very expensive, especially if they're coupled models. And if we have a way to reduce the number of 3D runs that we need to do, or at least, you know, make sure we perform some sanity checking on our innovations before we need to move to 3D runs, that can really save us a lot of compute time and space. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so enter in the, the HSD toolset. There's a number of ways that uh, we can uh, sanity check our innovations before we move to 3D full physics runs. So that can range anything from like the physics process simulator, where we check results from a single parameterization or even part of a parameterization, uh, to the single column model, which I'll talk quite a bit about in this presentation, where we can observe interactions between physics schemes in a very controlled environment, um, all the way up to models that you may be more familiar with or work on a daily basis with, like 3D modeling systems that can range from regional to global to fully coupled global models. And there's also a, an, a layer that we can add in terms of complexity um, by potentially utilizing either cold starts for some of these 3D modeling systems or performing cycled runs. And obviously the cycled DA introduces an extra level of complexity to the results and, and can make the, the results more difficult to interpret if we don't introduce that at the right time. So in general, we consider these, these parts of the testing harness that are more in blue to help us understand physical process interactions. Uh, while some of these uh, red colored systems help us understand uh, the full system interactions, which can be quite complex. So next slide. So uh, I, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with those three-dimensional modeling systems, but I will talk a bit about the single column model. So the single column model, it, it needs a starting point. So you need some initial vertical profiles of temperature, moisture, and, and winds. But those vertical profiles can be derived from a, a wide variety of places. You can get them from a, a field campaign. You can create some idealized vertical profiles as long as they're in balance with each other. Or you can derive them from a, a 3D modeling system. And as long as you have forcing that can be applied uh, to uh, demonstrate how these initial profiles evolve through time, you can run the SCM and you can observe the changes in the column state, which are going to be a combination of whatever forcing you apply and how the physics responds to, uh, to those, those forcings. Uh, so in essence, you're running a model without a dynamical core. You know, those, those forcings really take the place of the die core. Um, so there's a, a number of modes that you can run the single column model in. 
Uh, the SCM comes with a variety of case studies that have been derived from field campaigns. Uh, with these case studies, you also have the option to use your uh, custom surface heat fluxes to force the lower boundary of the atmosphere. So those could be, for instance, derived from the UFS, for instance. Um, and you can essentially use the SCM to mimic the performance of a, of a column within a 3D model. Uh, so you could essentially make adjustments to the physics code and see how uh, that column within the 3D system might have responded to those physics adjustments by running a single column from it. And I'll show an example of that uh, coming up. So next slide, please. Okay, so here's an example of using uh, the SCM uh, for physics evaluation. So on the left side, uh, the left plots are, are results from uh, the operational GFS version 16 physics package uh, compared to lasso large eddy simulation results. Uh, so the lasso LES is conducted uh, over the Southern Great Plains at the atmospheric radiation measurement site. And since it is LES, very high resolution, you know, we know we cannot treat this exactly as the truth, but we do think that it is closer to the truth than uh, some of our other modeling systems, which require us per to parameterize a number of the physics processes that are happening. Uh, so uh, what's great about these comparisons, they're an easy way to look at how physics developments might be changing the results. So on the left there, the results from version 16 compared to LASSO, and on the right is the latest uh, developmental physics suite that is being tested for GFS version 17. And we can sort of measure our progress relative to LASSO uh, going from version 16 to the developmental physics suite. So you can see there are some improvements. Uh, the issues with having a, a PBL in the evening that's rather cool and moist compared to LASSO that's largely improved in the uh, developmental physics suite. Uh, however, you can see that not all the problems have been fixed. Uh, the capping inversion at a height of about three kilometers tends to be significantly too strong in both physics suites. And the morning PBL tends to be a bit too warm and too dry compared to lasso. So there are room uh, for improvement here. Um, but it's easy to run the CCPP SCM. So anytime this developmental physics suite is adjusted, these tests can be repeated very easily. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, we also want to know, you know, to what extent can we use the SCM uh, to measure model performance across different grid spacings? So on the left is uh, a plot of two meter temperature bias uh, from a set of 3D UFS runs. Uh, the 25 kilometer run is shown in blue, 13 in green and three kilometer in red. And what you can see here is that in general, the temperature bias decreases as you go from a coarse resolution run like the 25 kilometer to the three kilometer run. Um, we also, we wanted to ask the question, can we see that behavior in some of our canned cases in the single column model? And indeed you can. If you adjust the column area within the SCM name list, you can see that over time, you end up getting cooler uh, low level temperatures in the SCM at high resolution relative uh, to the coarse resolution model results at 25 kilometers. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of the SCM column replay, uh, which is included in, in the latest version of the SCM code repository. So here, once again, we're trying to reproduce a column within a previously run uh, UFS LAMP simulation and compare that with the results from uh, the SCM, which is shown in blue here. And we have some observations shown in black just to show you how they compare to reality. Uh, so a 36 hour forecast is shown on the left, a 60 hour forecast is shown on the right. And you can see in general that the SCM does a very good job reproducing the temperature and uh, moisture profiles from the UFS LAM run. They both have this uh, tendency uh, to have a PBL that is too tall and uh, too dry um, within both the LAM and the SCM forecast. You can see a little bit of divergence between the SCM and the LAM within the mid-levels at the 60-hour mark. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. So remember when we run the SCM, we need to use uh, tendencies that have been derived from the LAM. In this case, those tendencies were available to us every hour, so they were not every model time step, which might help us reproduce the LAM profile a bit better. 
Um, but even so, the differences in that moisture profile only amount to about a tenth of a gram per kilogram. So in general, the correspondence is, is very good between the two. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to 3D runs, uh, I'd like to show you an example of using physics and dynamics tendencies to assess uh, model performance. So some of you will be familiar that the operational GFS version 16 has a low Cape bias over the central conus during the warm season. And these physics tendencies uh, are being used to diagnose the causes for that bias. So in the dashed lines, we have results from the previous version of the GFS version 15. And in the solid lines, we have results from the version 16 GFS. So if we just compare uh, the dashed blue lines, uh, which are the total physics tendencies, you can see that in the low levels, right around 990 millibars, there's this tendency um, for the GFS version 16 uh, to cool and dry within the lower boundary layer over time relative to the version 15. So this suggests why this problem may have gotten worse when we upgraded to version 16. Um, you might also see by scrutinizing these profiles that a lot of this uh, total temperature tendency and, and moisture tendency is being created by the dynamics tendencies, which are shown in red, suggesting that it may not be a completely uh, physics-related problem. Uh, going on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is an example of uh, testing with, with HWARF and how iterative testing and engaging with the community can really uh, uh, help the R2O process uh, be sped along. Uh, so back in 2015 or so, we had a couple of DTC visitors who identified some shortcomings in the GFDL radiation package when it's applied to hurricanes. And you can see in that upper right, those two upper right plots that near the top of the, the hurricane, uh, which is, this is a zonal cross section through the storm, you can see that there's very little cloud top cooling uh, created at the anvil level within the storm compared to what happens in the RRTMG radiation package. Um, and this was you know, known to be you know, a deficiency uh, within this package after these results were shown. Uh, so click ahead twice, uh, please, Jenny. So it, the thought at the time was that you know, perhaps switching to the RRTMG package might improve our hurricane forecasts. And unfortunately, they, it led to degradations in the track and intensity of hurricanes, even though uh, the scheme produced more physically realistic results. Uh, so at that point, uh, we needed to go back to the drawing board, and the DTC worked with Greg Thompson to develop a partial cloudiness scheme that accounts for subgrid clouds. And so you can see in these two plots um, in the bottom right that when this partial cloudiness scheme was implemented, there was a significant increase in the amount of cloud cover or fractional cloud cover over the oceans. And this compared much better with uh, satellite observations. So uh, this was tested and found that when the partial cloudiness scheme was coupled with RRTNG, it did produce improvements to hurricane track and intensity forecasts, and this was implemented in the 2015 HWARF. Uh, so click ahead twice, uh, Jenny. And so since that implementation, uh, we've had other DTC visitors, Mikey Okono and John Henderson, who have made further improvements to the parameterization of, of cloud overlap uh, within our TMG. And this has led to two additional uh, operational HWARF implementations. Uh, so go ahead to the next slide. So I know this presentation is brief, but I hope you see that there's a number of tools that we can use um, from the uh, HSD tool set to help us in uh, testing and evaluating our models. And when we engage with the community and perform iterative development, uh, we can uh, really help to contribute to the R2O process. So thank you very much. Thanks, Evan. Um, do we have any quick questions for Evan? And we do have discussion at the end of the session. So, um, but if there's something you'd like to ask right now, um, we can do that. Okay. If if not, um, we'll we'll hold that. So we'll move on to Michelle, and she's gonna talk to us about applications on MAT Plus and advancing its its capabilities. Take it away. All right, thanks, Louisa. 
So yep, today I'll be talking about advancements and applications of MET Plus and DTC testing and evaluation activities. And this presentation really is a compilation of work from a large number of DTC staff, uh, from the MET Plus team for their tireless development work, to the TME teams who are implementing and applying MET Plus in a number of evaluation activities. Uh, so I definitely want to thank all the folks that helped provide the materials that I'll be highlighting today. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so for those that are familiar with the um, how it started, how it's going meme, this is my take on the DTC testing and evaluation version. Uh, the plot on the left is from over a decade ago doing some wharf-based testing um, for the US Air Force. Now, fast forward to the near present day, uh, this is an example of more Air Force funded work, uh, but we're now focusing on providing advanced methods for cloud verification. Uh, creating traditional verification as seen in the plot on the left is still very much core to the model evaluation process. However, this provides a nice example of how one, MET and MET Plus have advanced over the years, and two, how testing and evaluation in the DTC has expanded beyond and complemented traditional verification with more advanced methods and tools. Um, so Tara provided some really nice um, pre-recorded materials that I hope you all got to see regarding MET Plus. Um, but to give a very basic overview, uh, MET Plus is a verification framework that supports the computation of both uh, basic and more advanced statistics for a broad spectrum of forecast applications that spans both deterministic and ensemble NWP systems, going from high resolution to coarse resolutions, and going from short and medium range weather applications all the way out to climate scales. Um, so with the DTC working um, with both the research community and operational centers, we are exposed to a fair number of forecast systems. Um, the beauty of MET Plus is that it is fairly model agnostic. Um, so while the forecast systems may differ among various operational centers, um, the verification and validation methods can be shared and leveraged across different projects and research initiatives. So this is essentially help making the R2O process more efficient. Um, so the goal of this presentation that I'll talk about today is to highlight and give you all a flavor of some of the applications and advancements of MET Plus um, within our DTC testing and evaluation um, in the past and current activities. Next slide, please. All right, so the first set of examples that I'll be highlighting are using MET's grid diag tool. Uh, this is a relatively new tool that has been added to MET in version 9.0.0. And the main function of this tool is to calculate the climatology of user specified fields and levels. And so it creates histograms um, for the individual fields and levels, as well as joint histograms um, for all the possible pairs of variables that are chosen. And so this really helps the user um, examine the relationship between multiple variables. Um, so some examples of the output of the PDFs and 2D histograms can be seen on the right hand side of the plot, um, right hand side of the slide here. Um, and I should note that this tool was originally developed under non-DTC funding. There was a, an NWS OSTI project between uh, NCAR and UIUC, but it has been further tested and applied under a number of DTC funded activities. Um, for example, Air Force, NOAA OAR, and um, UFS r to o All right, next slide, please. So to highlight an example of using the grid diag tool, uh, there is a current DTC testing and evaluation activity that is evaluating the baseline performance of the RFS for a suite of variables and levels. Uh, traditional verification from this test showed a high bias at all forecast lead times when considering composite reflectivity. Uh, so the team wanted to investigate this further by using the grid diag tool. Um, looking at the warm season data here in the upper figure, we have a PDF of the forecast data in red and the MRMS data's observations in blue. Uh, note that the vast majority of points in the domain are located in the first bin around 20 dBZ or minus 20 dBZ or so. Uh, when you restrict the plot from zero to 70 dBZ as seen in the inset there, it becomes apparent that from about 0 to 40 dBC, the RFS is over predicting composite reflectivity, which matches the traditional verification. Um, and then we also have a 2D histogram uh, in the lower figure here that provides another way of investigating the relationship between the forecast and observed reflectivity. Um, in this case, the dark blue line is uh, the one to one line. So looking at the probabilities here, uh, which kind of acts as a heat map, we can again see a shift towards a higher reflectivity bias. Um, and there is additional work on this project that is planning to use the grid diagram tool further uh, to investigate the relationship between multiple variables, such as cape and dew point. Next slide, please. All right, uh, so the next set of examples uh, will show some applications of the Tropical Cyclone Radius of Maximum Wind, or TCRMW tool. This was also added to MET in version 9.0.0. Uh, this tool was developed and has since been applied um, under NOAA OAR funding, and there have been also some enhancements under the NOAA Hurricane Supplemental funding as well. Uh, this tool regrids tropical cyclone model data onto a moving range azimuth grid uh, that's centered on points along the storm track. Uh, so in simple terms, it's allowing for users to put the model and observation data on storm relative coordinates and then normalizing by the radius of maximum wind. On the right, we have some nice examples from the development stage of this tool uh, using output from an early version of HEPV3 uh, with Hurricane Matthew. So we have the surface pressure and storm relative coordinates in the upper figure, 
And then an example of a cross section with tangential wind and temperature in storm relative coordinates in the lower figure. The next slide, please. Uh, so the TCRMW tool has been recently used on a DC, DTC project to evaluate precip precipitation at different grid scales. Uh, so in this example here, we have um, output from the UFS short range weather application that was run with the GFS version 16 beta physics suite, uh, three different resolutions, 25, 13, and three kilometers. Um, in the four panel plot here, we're using CCPA as observations in the lower right. Um, and this was run for the Hurricane Laura case. And from this work, it was shown that as the grid length becomes finer, so as you go to three kilometers, uh, there tends to be an increase in precipitation, uh, which more closely matches the observations. Um, all the runs do correctly place the maximum rainfall in the northern eye wall. Um, however, none of the runs are able to produce enough rainfall on the western side of the storm. Um, so overall, results are suggesting that finer grid spacing is needed to resolve the outer rain bands and to obtain more accurate QPFs of hurricanes in the UFS. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so next up is the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation, or the MODE tool. This has actually been an original tool in MET since its first release uh, with version 0.9. Um, development has been funded under both DTC and non-DTC initiatives, um, and has been applied to a number of DTC projects over the years and enhanced along the way as well. Um, so at its core, it's a feature-based verification method that helps identify and match objects in two different fields, typically the forecast and observed field. Um, and in this example on the right, um, in the top set of figures, we have brightness temperature fields from the GFS on the left and then GO16 on the right. Then the bottom, we have the mode objects that were identified for both the forecast and observed fields um, on the light, left and right, respectively. When you see the same colored objects between the two fields, this indicates that objects have been matched. Um, and then the royal blue shades indicate the false alarms and misses uh, between the forecast and observed, respectively. Um, so from these objects, you can get information related to object number, coverage area, displacement, orientation, and intensity. And this helps provide diagnostic information beyond traditional verification. Um, so mode is really a highly user configurable tool, and it really can be configured based on the science questions that are uh, being addressed um, within your research project. And this tool has been applied to a number of applications going from high resolution storm scale applications um, all the way out to S2S type applications. Next slide, please. So to showcase some um, recent usage of mode, um, I'll highlight some key application and results from some work we recently completed um, for the Air Force to perform veracity testing on the Global Synthetic Weather Radar, or GSWR products. Uh, these are radar-based products that are produced by MIT Lincoln Laboratories with um, advanced machine learning techniques. Um, and so as, as a re direct result of the work that we did for the Air Force, um, several enhancements were made to MET Plus, um, including the ability to ingest the operational European weather radar data, the OPER data, as well as the GSWR data. Um, and this was done through MetPlus's um, Python embedding capabilities. Um, in addition, the ability to use the Lambert azimuthal equilaria production to MET was also added. So two, two key enhancements as a result of this work. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this slide shows some key highlights from the object-based verification when comparing GSWR versus the OPER data. And we're looking at uh, composite reflectivity objects greater than or equal to 20 dBz. Uh, for the upper left plot, we have the total object counts for GSWR in blue, OPER in black. And for this plot and all the other plots on this slide, um, we have the valid time going across the x-axis. Um, so we see that GSWR is following the OPER object counts. However, it's typically producing about half as many objects. Um, so now going over to the upper right, we see that the objects in GSWR are typically larger in area than the objects identified in OPERA. Um, so from the first two set of plots, we're seeing that GSWR is typically producing too few large objects. Um, now going down to the lower set of plots, in the lower left, we have the 90th percentile intensity of objects. Uh, this helps us identify how well GSWR is capturing the most intense objects. Um, so overall, we are seeing that GSWR peak intensities are typically lower than OPER for all valid times um, when comparison to truth. And then going over to the uh, lower right plot, we have centroid displacement for the west-east displacements in red, and then the south-north displacements in blue. Um, at all valid times, we see negative values. So this is indicating that GSWR um, typically has a slight southern and western displacement when compared to the truth data set. It is worth noting that these results um, are fairly robust and tended to scale across some of the other observation data sets that were used in this study. Next slide, please. All right, so to wrap up, the last set of examples um, are using um, iMERGE data or the integrated multi-satellite retrieval for GPM data within MET. Um, iMERGE data um, are precipitation estimates that have near global coverage and are from the GPM constellation. They're fairly high resolution. Um, they have about uh, 10th degree spatial resolution. 
And with the DTC supporting testing and evaluation over the CONUS, as well as having a number of OCONUS and global uh, evaluations, having a precipitation product like iMERGE to use for evaluations is exceptionally beneficial. Uh, the original capability to um, both ingest and bucket iMERGE data uh, was done under Air Force funding, but then we have been using iMERGE data on a number of Air Force, NOAA OAR, and UFS RTO projects within the DTC over the last several years. Next slide, please. Uh, so the first set of examples to highlight the use of iMERGE data is from an Air Force funded initiative, uh, which is assessing the value of convective scale models being run at different grid lengths. Um, in this particular example, we're looking at Gallim regional window output over South Korea, and we have four kilometer and one and a half kilometer output that we're comparing against iMERGE data. Um, a recent addition to the grid stat tool as of MET version 9.0.0 is the ability to use distance maps to calculate statistics that can help measure forecast quality by providing results in terms of spatial distance. Um, so in the simplest of terms, um, distance maps um, result from calculating the shortest distance from every grid point in the domain to the nearest grid point event. Um, and Eric Gilliland has a great paper um, that I'd highly recommend if you wanted to learn more about this, um, the different measures to read about. So on the right, um, there are some examples of three hour accumulated precipitation um, from the forecast and observations. And then on the lower panel, we have the associated distance maps um, that were created using the grid stat tool. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, um, there are a number of uh, distance map measures that GridScat can calculate, including the mean error distance, the Badley's delta metric, and then the Hausdorff distance. And for all the measures that we're showing here on this plot, um, lower uh, scores are considered better. So we do see that, that our small sample of data um, scores generally between the one and a half and four kilometer runs are similar. In this case, the uh, one and a half kilometer runs are in the darker shades of the colors and the four kilometer runs are in the lighter shades. Uh, we do see some larger differences at the end of the forecast period. Um, and in this case, we do see that the one and a half kilometer run um, are performing a little bit better. Next slide, please. And so the second example highlighting iMERGE is from a, a recent UFS R to O funded project that is actually leveraging enhancements uh, that were made to the PCB combined tool and met under NGGPS funding from several years ago. Um, so for some background, the PCB combined tool summarizes data across um, gridded input data files and then writes out a single gridded net CDF file that can either be used on its own for evaluation or used down the line in other MET tools such as GridStat. Um, so typically it's all, most often used to modify precipitation accumulations, um, but there also have been recent enhancements that have been done to um, derive summary fields such as daily max or min or average values. Um, so in the results that are highlighted here, uh, we're looking at activity that aimed at testing and evaluated updated physics within the UFS medium range weather application. In this set of plots here, we have iMERGE that we're using as truth, and that's in the topmost plot. And then we have control run uh, with GFS version 16 physics in the second plot. And then the two updated physics that we're referring to as CCA 27 and 41 in the two bottom plots, respectively. And for the model plots, um, we're actually taking the model minus iMERGE, so they're difference plots. Um, the two updated physics configurations included changes to the PBL, convection, surface layer, and what's known as the CA, stochastic convective organization scheme. And so from this test using the iMERGE data, some key findings when looking at precipitation include um, seeing an overall overestimation of precipitation, and this is seen especially over the oceanic areas. Um, a northward shift of the Eastern Pacific ITCZ is also observed in the boreal winter, which is the set of data we're looking at here. Um, and then for the two advanced physics suites, um, the two bottommost plots, we see a slight reduction um, of the positive bias in the tropical rainfall over the Indo-Pacific warm pool. And we also see a larger wintertime precipitation bias over the Eastern CONUS. Next slide, please. All right, so as we wrap up this presentation, um, I'll just leave the key takeaways here. Um, but I will say the goal of this presentation was to provide a spectrum of examples using MET+. Uh, so if anybody has any additional questions, um, I or the other folks on the teams of the work I presented, um, or the MET Plus developers that are on the call, um, I'm sure we would be happy to discuss them further. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Becky, you have a quick question? Hi, thanks, Michelle. Very interesting. Um, could you just provide me a brief description of the difference between uh, MET and MET Plus? You know, I could. Um, if Tara's on the line, I think she could probably do that in a far better manner than me. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, um, we're in a transition zone right now where, you know, we used to have MET and now we have the MET plus wrappers that, that wrap around um, MET. And, um, and so right now, a lot of people are referring to MET and MET plus, but really we all need to change our vernacular. 
and we just need to start referring to it as the MET plus system. So, um, or framework, uh, basically it's, it's all kind of one big package. Um, but basically the, the MET plus, um, is the extension of the, the Python wrappers around the MET tools, as well as, um, we now have, um, five, uh, components of the, um, analysis capability. So, um, there's two, uh, user interfaces to do analysis plus, um, three backend, um, capabilities to, you know, to drive that, those analysis analyses. And, um, and, and the lines are going to start blurring between, um, you know, what is done in, in MET and what's done in the analysis suite and what's, you know, um, done in MET plus and, and so forth. So, um, I'd really actually like to encourage everyone to just start referring to it as MET plus. Does that help? Thanks. That's helpful. Okay. Yes, indeed. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if there's not any other ones right now, we'll move on to Dave Turner's presentation. Uh, so Dave wants to uh, get our brains started uh, thinking about ingre ingredients for a uh, the DTC becoming a T and E powerhouse. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, I'm I finding that this presentation is going to build pretty strongly on what Michelle just said. That it has a you know flavors going all the way back to this morning, and and what is ultimately the the role of the DTC moving Epic uh, and the UFS development forward. So next slide, please. So you know we can ask ourselves you know why are we doing this? Why do we want to evaluate these models and products? It's both for model development to improve our representation of atmospheric processes, to improve our ability to initialize the modeling systems, to, to capture a couple of processes like between the ocean, and ice, and atmosphere. And so really it's about improving predictions, improving the diagnosed products that come from those predictive models. But I think there's also, you know, uh, we want to think about it from the stakeholder perspective too, and, and what are the impacts of these products, uh, of these forecasts on actual decision-making people. Um, and so, you know, how should, so we, we should also be considering evaluating our model from their perspective. Next click, please. Um, but we all know that the model output is very large. It's multidimensional. It's hard to get our minds around it. So if we want to compare against observations. We often have to do a lot of post-processing against the ops to reduce the volume, especially with the real-time models, which are continually pumping out terabytes of data a day. You know, we have to, you know, evaluate these things quickly reduce the volume storm in some way that allows us to, to analyze the data. We often are doing this large scale averaging um, and we're accumulating these model of differences, typically over different spatial regions. And those statistics, looking at bias and RMS and contingency table scores, et cetera, can be informative, but they can also be misleading. Uh, how can they be misleading? Well, it's, it's very easily, if you don't understand the statistical distribution behind those statistics, you know, understanding a mean doesn't really mean anything if you have a bimodal distribution underneath. So I, I'm going to ask a provocative question. Next click. Has our model development plateaued? Let me give you an example. Next slide. So we've been developing in GSL the HER for, you know, over the last decade. And so here what I'm showing is the RMSC, the root mean square error, in both two meter temperature on the left and the 10 meter wind speed on the right. The different colors represent different versions of the model over that decade. And so you can clearly see that, you know, from the pre-HER, you know, system, which was in black and version one, which is in blue, as all the way up to version four, which became operational in December of 2020 in red, you can see that the RMS error is in fact decreasing and that is good. But click, uh, you also can get a sense that the RMS error is remaining stubbornly large. And so if you look at the values on the y-axis, you can see that we've decreased the RMS error, you know, 20, 30% perhaps, but those RMS values are still very large. And in fact, it looks like we're reaching an asymptote. And so if you look at the differences between version three and version four, the yellow versus the red lines, they're pretty much identical. These statistics suggest that the model improvement is not improving, but we know the modeling system is getting better. We have anecdotal evidence from stakeholders actually that indicate that, you know, for example, the wind energy community has had so much 
they're really so excited about version four, for example, because it does such a better job predicting wind ramps than any other prediction system that they have available. And so from that point of view, from that type of information, we know the modeling system is getting better. These statistics don't really reflect that. So are we reaching an asymptote? Maybe, maybe not. Next click. It may just be how we're using our tools to identify model errors. And so maybe we need a new way to do it. Next click. So I'm going to propose that what we need to do is start to try to identify what atmospheric processes are we not capturing well within our modeling systems. And there's many of them that I'm sure we're not capturing. And so I'm going to colloquially call this process-oriented verification. But what I really mean is these are atmospheric processes that we're not you know, capturing properly. If we start thinking about coupled models, it's, it's about processes in those coupled systems. So you know, ice modeling, uh, ocean modeling, et cetera. Next click. One approach to start understanding what processes are captured properly or not is to try to discriminate your statistics into as a function of the atmospheric phenomenon you know so for example we could look at stratiform versus convective precipitation because different processes are at work in the two we could look at the land use type if we're interested about land atmosphere interactions or the you know cloud conditions because different clouds have a different impact on both the radiative fields as well as the turbulent fields or graphic cold pools locations relative to like a frontal boundary local stability soil moisture all these could be looked at so Click, please. As an example, on land use within GSL, we do distinguish and look at the, the surface verification as a function of land type, land use type. And so if you look at this, you can clearly see this is version four, six months of statistics over CONUS over the last uh, you know, earlier part of this year. You can see we have very different behavior, very different performance in urban environments versus water environments, for example, and that these this performance changes as a function of of the, the valid hour, the time of day. And so there's lots of work that we need to do to sort of continue to use that information to help our understanding and to realize what are we doing perhaps correctly over grassland that we're not doing correctly over, over water surfaces, for example. I think that this type of atmospheric phenomenon-based verification is also really useful if we're looking at impact-based assessment. So from an aviation community, uh, they're very interested in, for example, where's the convection? And are we doing a good job predicting the location of the convection so that they can improve their routing products? Uh, similarly, again, from the aviation community, you can talk about fog and ceiling height around airports or from the wind energy community about the, you know, the, the speed of the winds that you predict uh, tomorrow. So all of these are really important and I think are just other uses of this uh, process-oriented verification or, or verification by the atmospheric phenomenon. Next click, please. So what is needed to get there? Uh, we already saw from Michelle that we could use object-based verification. So I'm just going to do a little bit more about some of the stuff we're doing in GSL. Click, please. Uh, we are using mode uh, to compute uh, and identify objects, both within the model and the observations. After you have those objects, you can start to compare attributes from these objects. And as she indicated, there's a lot of different um, flexibility. There's a lot of flexibility in this particular tool. Some of the things you might look at is the distance between the centroids of the objects or the aspect ratio differences between the object in the model and the object in the observation, uh, the complexity of the objects in one versus the other. And so I'll give an example of looking at reflectivity objects in her version three against the MRMS for a warm season reflectivity. And so what you can see is if you use traditional um, grid to grid frequency analysis, those would be the dashed lines. And so the different colors of the dashed lines are showing uh, for different reflectivity thresholds. If I look at the objects and I compute an object frequency bias, you can see that the object frequency bias is typically much larger than the grid to grid frequency bias. And so, of course, you can change this a little bit by changing the sizes of the neighborhoods you use in the grid-to-grid -grid analysis. But still, knowing that you're having a lot more objects that have a certain reflectivity than you're seeing in the in the observations is a useful thing for modelers to understand. But you can take it one step farther. Click. You can look at how that frequency bias changes as a function of object area. And so, in this particular case, for tw the 25 dBz objects. Uh, the HER was producing a lot more small objects than the observations were showing, and fewer large objects. That's very interesting if you're from a modeler trying to think about what type of 
process or what type of you know behavior could be leading to this. And then one more click, we can see that we also have a difference in the complexity, where the objects in the model are less complex, i.e., more you know spherical or or, or uh, as a polygon than what we're seeing in the observations themselves. The observations are showing more complexity, and so that it's giving you a sense of maybe we have too much smoothing or diffusion still happening within the model, and that is leading to some of this behavior. And you can you can look at this very easily as a function of object size or object uh, aspect ratio, etc. Next click. So beyond object-based verification, we can also just generate statistics from the model ops pairs uh, as a function of some sort of discriminators. And so what this would mean is they're gonna have to have less partial summing. And so instead of collecting a set of model ops pairs and starting to compute statistics over regions and very, you know, as a way to reduce your data volume, you'll you'll leave, you'll do less of that partial summing, you'll include those discriminators. But that means you're storing a lot more data. You have to have a lot more data available for your verification system to work with. That's big volume. I think a lot of this atmospheric process oriented type verification really enables hypothesis testing. You can see a result. What you want to do is you want to ask a different question and say, well, oh, wow, these objects are more complex in the observations in the model. Is this true for the big objects as well as the small objects? That's a hypothesis. You want to be able to test that quickly. So you want to be able to basically query that data volume quickly so you can you know, get at the answer uh, fast. So I think this is going to require big scalable databases. We're going to be storing a lot more data. We need to be able to add more capability to the system that stores that data easily without always rebuilding your tables. So I think we're going to need to move to no SQL type solutions. Uh, for those who are familiar with databases, those type of database systems are sort of very flexible. Um, and so you actually need to have a very good model for how you want to store the data, otherwise it becomes you know, basically a train wreck in, within, inside your database. And so you don't want that. So we need to think ahead to build a good data model that we use within the NoSQL solution. And then ultimately, we need to have a flexible and then an intuitive GUI in order to query that database and get solutions that we can see, plots that we can see on the browser. This is probably somewhere between MetViewer and MetExpress. There are a lot of new technologies out there and, and additional technologies are coming out every, every week, I swear, that are able to handle these big data sets. I think we need to do some research to help evaluate them and decide which ones of them really add value to tearing into these large data. Click, please. Go ahead and click, please. But I think what we've also seen is, you know, we need to continue to evaluate and utilize different observations, uh, especially from the satellites. So we saw a very nice example again from Michelle about looking at just mic microwave brightness temperature and iMERGE type observations. In both of those cases are very different. The brightness temperatures in radiant space, perhaps not a lot of people think in radiant space and understand what a, a 10 Kelvin error means at, you know, 23 gigahertz. But in precipitation, we do understand that. But that requires, uh, click please, that we understand the errors and, and how we're representing them. We may need to actually put instrument simulators in line. So if we wanted to actually evaluate brightness temperatures, we want to make sure that the radiation codes that compute those brightness temperatures are representing all the subgrid scale processes that are within the code, you know, for example, the subgrid scale clouds. And so often in our operational output, we don't output all the fields needed to properly simulate an instrument. And so we may need to actually consider putting those in line. Next click. If we're working with observations, and especially if we're working with retrievals, we need to understand there are, there are those uncertainties. Uh, that way we can actually decide what is the practical significance of the result. If we have, uh, for example, a bias that is down to one Kelvin error, is that, is that important? We, is that actually significant beyond the instrument uncertainty, the retrieval uncertainty? So I think this is going to require ultimately that we have some additional observational type people within the DTC who can help us understand those type of retrievals, or we need to work much more closely with the observationalists in ESDIS and other agencies directly. Next click, please. And of course, we need to continue moving all this verification to not only work on our hard iron within, uh, within our NOAA HPC systems, but also on the cloud. So what do it's a TNE powerhouse do? What could it do? So here's just a couple ideas from where I'm sitting. Next click. 
I think that Net Plus is a very powerful uh, tool set, and we want to continue to develop use cases to show how you can string together all those different tools together using the, the Net Plus wrappers, et cetera, to make useful verification uh, tools. I think because there's so many ways to do it, you know, we probably need to be leading the way and identifying new applications that provide insight and unique insight into model behavior. So sometimes the model developers don't know what's possible until we show them. And I think that is something that the DCC is well positioned to do. I do think if we're going to do this phenomenon-based verification or process-oriented verification, it's going to require many discriminators. And it's, the thing is that we don't, what I'm imagining is as we're going forward and as the model, the model development teams become more used to it, they're going to ask for more and more discriminators as we go forward. So that's going to lead to, next click please, uh, that we're going to need to have this tight coupling continuing between the meteorologists and the model developers and our software engineers so that we can, because we're going to need to have new development needed on a database and the underlying processing system. We need it to be fast and quick. It needs to be scalable as these data volumes increase. Um, that fast interactive querying is going to be really important if we want to actually look at process oriented in a hypothesis testing framework, which is the best thing for those early uh, technical readiness levels. But as we move forward and we start getting closer to operations, we need to be able to generate static plots uh, so that you can have static plots computed regularly and routinely that can be quickly viewed. Uh, that's very easily done within the MET Plus uh, framework. Next click. Uh, again, I think this close interaction with model developers is key. You know, we need to understand what are the problems they're working on uh, so that we can more easily go back and, and develop tools that will provide insights into the problems that they're working on. They may not know what type of tools are available or, you know, for example, in our lab, we developed a new plot type. The model developers never asked for it, but after they saw what our plot type was, it became one of the most popular ways to view model output relative to observations. Next click. I do think we need to think about and lead the, the way on what new observations can lend insight into model behavior. Uh, we, we have talked about in the UFS community for a while that we need an observation team. I think in the, the way I would rephrase that is, does the TTC need an observation team to actually look at the observations there, figure out which ones will have the greatest value for the buck of, you know, given that developer time is limited, which ones should we focus on first? Next click. I think we need to continue the development and use of the HTF. I, I think the presentation that Evan gave today was exactly right. We need to be able to evaluate uh, models with different, uh, different, uh, diff the different tools, all the way from an SCM up to the coupled 3D model. One of the key points in using earlier parts of the HTF is the forcing data set. So Evan was exactly right. The results there can be very sensitive to the forcing data set. I think we need to be considering how can we evaluate forcing data sets to decide the, the, whether this forcing data set is good or bad. And of course, the, it does come down to the application. If you're trying to force a model to look at shallow cumulus, it may be a very different problem than if you're trying to force a model to look at deep convection. Next slide, please. So this, all of this kind of leads to the question, are we, the DTC, leading our activities? Or are we contributing to the activities of others? And I think the, the answer is we want to be able to do both. Next click. So that moves us to, in my mind, what is our role in EPIC and the UFS development? And so Henrik gave a nice presentation showing you know, the various different gates moving through the readiness levels of, of one through operations. And you know the, the various gates going from different stages of development. Presumably, the Environmental Modeling Center is going to oversee gate four. They currently do now. They will continue to do so in the future. But what what should DTC be doing relative to those earlier gates? Henrik you know, made a good point that DTC has a real role to play in gates number three uh, and perhaps some roles in gate one and two. I think with you know, defining what those roles are would be very useful. Next click, please. But we also have a lot of uh, you know, transitions. You know, and so Henrik showed the, the funnels leading to funnels. And I think that this is where the, the HTF uh, becomes very useful. Having that hierarchical testing framework allows us to look at these different components perhaps more easily, more in isolation. This is like any good software test. You, you test both as you know, individual standalone functions and then as they work within the larger thing. I think there's a real role there too. Next click, please. 
And so now it gets into my model of, of, of the UFS development. And so what I'm showing is on this upper row above the solid red line is NOAA operations. They use both restricted and unrestricted data through some data simulation to the initialize the operational model, which provides forecasts and diagnosed products, which are fed through MetPlus to compare against observations, which then can be viewed uh, either statically, you know, through pre-generated images or, you know, interactively through Met, Met Trust Net, Net Viewer. I think that, you know, if we, we have this larger research community that wants to be able to run experimental models and actually test components, for example, physics parameterizations or data assimilation improvements, et cetera, and be able to evaluate those relative to the operational model. And so that's kind of happening in the larger research community. I really think that there probably is a strong need to have a, an operational model, perhaps the, the operational model and an experimental model running in parallel with what's happening in NOAA operations, something that is using just the unrestricted data, the things that the larger research community has access to that could be used to test things as they become moving higher through the readiness level uh, framework. So as something passes, for example, gate gate number three, what is the bonus for passing gate number three? Maybe your, your scheme is able to be operated within the experimental operational model. So it can be run real time to see how it runs day to day and, and regular everyday forecasts. That's a really critical component to improving a, an observational prediction system. So I think there's a question about whether DTC and EPIC operates in that sort of that middle layer there that I've identified. Clearly the DTC is gonna to continue to develop tools that are used both uh, to develop the modeling systems themselves, you know, the ACF tools, for example, as well as the verification tools. So one last set of clicks, please. I think really some questions I'd like to ask the question to the group is, you know, is model development starting to reach an asymptote or is this just due to the way we're using our current tools? And if it's the latter, how can we use our current tools uh, more cleverly, or do we need new tools? Next click. Is process-oriented or phenomenon-oriented verification a good way forward? And if we agree it is, again, how do we prioritize the potentially infinite number of ways uh, to add new discriminators and tools to our toolkit? Next click. How do we, if we're gonna do that, how do we wanna take advantage of new technology? You know, for example, a NoSQL database. Do we need to get buy-in from all the different stakeholders that the DTC is supporting? Everything from NOAA's modeling community to the you know, Naval Research Lab or the UK Met Office. You know, is that really required? Another question to answer. Next click, please. How do we promote and continue to use a hierarchical testing framework going forward? Uh, and in in particular, in my mind, a key part of that is how do we evaluate forcing data sets for the LES and the SCM type modeling systems? Next click, please. Do we need a real time kind of quasi operational like experimental UFS modeling system? Something that can be used after something passes gate three to test components that have passed gate three in an operational like way that's running day to day to day so you can see its impact on forecasts. That's a question. And lastly, what have I missed? So maybe I'll stop there and take any questions, or actually what I'd like to do is not necessarily take questions, but just start the discussion. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dave. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you had questions specifically for, for Dave or, or Michelle or, or Evan, or, I mean, we're pretty much opened up to um, a general discussion time period um, before we take a break and then um, the science advisory board members you guys will go into an SAB only session so definitely if you have any questions for um, DTC staff that will help facilitate your discussion now, now would be the time to ask those questions um, or you can go ahead and make comments on, on uh, um, ideas that you've heard so far today. So Lisa put a very nice question into the chat box uh, about the hypothesis testing. Uh, and she, she says, and I agree with her totally, that hypothesis testing is a critical aspect and should be a pillar of every T&E activity. I totally agree with that. 
you know, I don't actually, I believe almost all of our modelers, when they are making a change to the modeling system, be it, you know, some improvement, some possible improvement to the DA, some possible improvement to a parameterization or a diagnostic product, they're trying to address some problem. You know, maybe we're not doing a good enough job vocalizing that. You know, and, and so I do think that maybe that's what is needed too. Again, this is this conversation I feel like is sometimes is not there between people who are doing the evaluation and the people who are doing the development uh, in that regard, is understanding better the motivation and uh, what are the modeling, uh, I'm, you know, for lack of a better word, the model developers trying to accomplish as part of their work. So I agree with, with Lisa saying, I don't know if I have any uh, particular um, suggestions there other than I support it and how can we get people to vocalize what their hypotheses are. Yeah. Ryan, do you have a comment? Yeah, thanks. I, I actually have several, so I'll just start talking and maybe that gets some discussion going here. So yeah. um, Dave, I wholly endorse your discussion on the process-based side. Um, I'll just add in what are, you know, my, you know, watching from near but afar on the H wharf development was that in in all in the time that I've been in HFIP, which was in the beginning, it seemed to me that the biggest improvement of that model came when the model was the biggest improvement intensity forecast, I should say, came when people stopped necessarily just looking at, you know, kind of the top line metrics of being track and intensity and started evaluating how was the model doing against just on a process based side on the on the boundary layer and pretty quickly it was discovered that you know the boundary layer was over mixing by like a factor of 3 or 4 something where the rate was over mixing at a factor of 3 or 4 and this was transporting all sorts of heat and heat and momentum upward and the, and you know, the, the model was basically being tuned to dealing with this bias um, that was present in, the, it was a bias and inherited from the GF, GFS PBL scheme. And once that was addressed, there was almost a step-like drop in intensity error that, that was present um, in intensity the next season. Now, when that happened, of course, there were all sorts of other biases that showed up because all the other pieces of the model had been tuned to deal with that original PBL bias, but it at least started disentangling what the um, what the issue was. And so, you know, I think one of the one of the stressors always is that you know we have stakeholders that always will have you know, whatever metrics that they're looking for, right? Whether it's 500 millibar scores or two meter temperature or 10 meter winds. And we always um, operate under the assumption that by making these processes better, we're gonna make those metrics better. But we always, we, we seem to get trapped, especially in the operational side of always looking at those metric scores rather than on the, on the process based side. So, I, you know, this is a very long winded thing to just to say, I, I wholly endorse this process-based side, a uh, process-based um, approach. Because I think in getting back to your question about whether things are asymptote, I think the answer is yes. I think there's a lot of evidence um, from even beyond um, what you said. I, I, I know um, Chris Lancey wrote a pretty provocative paper um, that appeared in BAMS two or three years ago about tropical cyclone track forecasting asymptoting. Um, and so, you know, maybe our approach to should be to go after those really difficult cases, the, the ones that are really vexing our models, which means, you know, not necessarily these big um, piles of statistics of improvement, but at really on the on the tails of the distribution and trying to pull those tails, high error cases back in. Uh, I'll, I'll let Hendrik speak, and then I'll go to my second point that I was going to bring up here. I just wanted to say I, I really do appreciate that statement in the sense of the, the resolving one bias is often exposed many other biases. So it, it gets into a philosophical question. Are we willing to let our modeling systems go become slightly worse in order to actually get better because we're actually reproducing and representing you know particular processes more accurately now? Yeah, yeah I, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with you what you're saying, Ryan. Uh, the, uh, the 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 quick win in operations is a tuner model. The sustained improvement is getting the right answer for the right reason. And um, 
And I, I love that example from uh, uh, from uh, the uh, HFIP, although it's sort of lost in uh, it, it's lost in the noise a little bit because it was a massive jump that that only barely brought us to becoming actually predictable based on a physical model from the complete lack of predictability before that. I, I would say there's there's a, a an other example from the past that shows that uh, making sure that your metric you have metrics that looking at physical processes because that forces you to get the right answer for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the history of what we done with model coupling, I've personally been pushing model coupling for almost two decades by now. The first 10 years of doing model coupling, uh, a lot of the model coupling experiments by themselves failed in the sense that we never got to operations, but we found all these weird behaviors in physics of the models at the interfaces that actually made the individual models massively better because we had different eyes looking at the physics of the model. And some things were really stupid. I mean, we had, I won't call any names, but when we started coupling uh, uh, an atmosphere model to an ocean model, uh, only then did we see that accidentally the sun came up twice in one of the weather models per day. And it's, I mean, it is that kind, it is that kind of fundamental things that you're missing if you're only looking at the 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 outcome metrics instead of the process mm -hmm. metrics. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the the whole experience we've had with the quote unquote failing of coupling the first decade was the massive success of doing much better things physically in the boundary layer of the coupled models in those same 10 years. And so mm -hmm. all, all arguments for the same case, and this is an argument where why we've been saying, and I've been pushing for that same thing uh, for the last few years that uh, the next step forward with something like Matt Plus is to to make sure that you start including more and more of the physics uh, uh, processes uh, metrics in there, because to quote Mike Eck, you have to get the right model for the right or the right answer for the right reason. So, hundred percent agree. Absolutely. So this kind of gets me at the second question that I have, and maybe this is a little bit broader. One is, where does field program data fit into the evaluation suite? Um, because a, a lot of what I see in Met, and, and please correct me if my um, understanding is not correct, is a lot of it is, you know, kind of on routine observations, whether it be radar data, surface radiosons, um, satellite data. So what about special field program data sets? How well does Met um, assess ingest it and is there been some concerted effort to use more field data especially past field data i know tara's got her hand up so i'll let her she probably is going to address that um yeah so yeah i think uh with the advent of python embedding that um you know was introduced two years ago uh the ability of met plus to be able to handle um field project data has increased significantly um, basically, then all we need to have is, um, you know, a reader for the for the data mm -hmm. and then um, in Python and then, uh, you know, just have uh, that reader also then uh, format the, the data into an array that um, MET can handle. And so that suddenly makes it a lot better, um, you know, a lot more uh, feasible to, to use those data sets. We have had um, multiple proposals that we have submitted to multiple calls. Um, to try and, and start working more with field project data and mesonet data and, and so forth um, and haven't really been successful um, to for, for the most part on um, having those those um, projects funded yet but hopefully we'll be getting there right now we do have a uh, one um, project with Mike Eck and um, and others Paul Dermeyer and others um, on the class project to, to start trying to work more with land surface model, um, you know, uh, the data for evaluating LSMs and so forth. Um, we do have an example of using tailborne Doppler radar and drop sons for hurricanes um, now available. So, so we're starting to, to grow that, um, that arsenal of, of data um, uh, capability, but um, we still have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking of, you know, it, it, you got you know half of DTC is at NCAR. NCAR um, EOL has this massive archive of old um, 
field project data, which, you know, they've been do working um, some in the last two or three years of trying to develop a database that searches that um, data much easier. And, you know, I know that there's some variety in what format that's in um, from experiment to experiment. There's some, some of the NCAR um, data sets, NCAR instrumented data sets are in a more common, but, you know, if PIs are supplying data sets, it's a little bit different, but um, it just seems to me that's a, that's a really rich, data set coming back to, you know, some of the, you know, priority areas that were discussed here of Dave of being, Dave discussed of being a process based or, or T&E based um, entity. So I think there's a real role for those field campaigns. I mean, we've seen before you can get great insight because there are observations you normally don't get. You know, we've made with the herb uh, a lot of improvement in our representation of coal pools because of field campaigns. Of course, the challenge then is making sure that it generalizes beyond the field campaign period and location. And so we still need the process oriented to work with the, the larger operational data. But maybe I ask a different question is, let's suppose there are some data sets that are collected during field campaigns that are, you know, not every observational type can be moved through the readiness levels to operations, but some can. What is the role of the DTC to say, you know, this observation here was really critical in this op in this campaign about getting additional observations in a more operational frame so we can use them more regularly? Is there a role for this for the DTC in that regard? Yeah, and if you, if you look at uh, the stages engaged, I talked about that is the place places where stage two and perhaps stage one bleeds into what the DTC should do also, from from my perspective, and. Um, uh, to uh, uh, to go to go back to the discussion about these data set in MET, there's, there's two things to think about. First of all, what Tara was talking about, the fact that that you have to make it so that MET can read that kind of uh, input and actually make make metrics out of it. Uh, the other one is a more philosophical one. Uh, uh, what is the extent of data that you want to have available uh, live and in real time in MET? Are you concentrating on this year in the last three years, or are you concentrating on the last 30 or 40 years? And so this is where philosophically, uh, what are you doing with MET and what are you doing with the reforecast three analysis? Where do they overlap? Uh, that is, a, I think, a little bit more of a philosophical question where you have to, to think about a little bit. And um, and especially if we are moving a lot of these things into the cloud and in that way making uh, access of the bigger data sets somewhat easier for cloud people, we may have to think about uh, where MET overlaps with the reforecast and the reanalysis work we're doing, or reanalysis particularly. Thanks. There may be a role about taking some of those older data sets and conditioning them to make them easier to use for past, you know, for re going back and doing reforecasts and reanalyses. Um, the Department of Energy's ARM program does exactly that with its, some of its data sets. This package is some of the most useful data for model development in easy to use forms for developers to use. Yeah, and, and, as, and as a previous, uh, uh, previously very active wave modeler, our international wave modeling community has, has gone through an effort of uh, homogenizing uh, uh, pretty much all the existing wave data up to uh, the beginning of the, the buoy era and, and, uh, and, the, and the satellite era in the in the early 70s in a sense that uh, they're all bias corrected the same way, they're all formatted the same way. And I mean, if that, that's, that's a relatively small problem uh, compared to the other big data sets, but uh, it's a good example of that there's an enormous benefit of doing that because we basically can can take pretty much any any test period we want to look at and we know we have, we have all the data available in the central point to begin with. Sorry, Mike, keep talking over you. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Well. Louisa, do you need to jump in as the um, moderator or anything? Okay, I was just going to add, um, maybe it goes without saying, but process level needs to be examined all across this hierarchy from looking at just one simple process all the way to the fully coupled model. Now, we are, our, our typical NWP metrics, we can't um, do a 500 millibar height anomaly correlation score when we're just focusing on the surface layer turbulence or something. But we can certainly look at all the process level metrics in the fully coupled model. And the great example I always like to use is, whoa, our model is doing really good with the ENSO index. Okay, there's some field program data and I dig deep and I see that, whoa, these ocean surface fluxes are terrible. 
but we're still getting the right ENSO. So you start looking under the hood and you discover all these things. What Hendrik is saying, what a lot of us know. So let's just kind of apply these, these, met, these processable metrics just across the spectrum of what we're trying to do. And it's difficult, so. So I just wanted to follow up on, um, I, I think this is all great. And yes, we need to look at as many data sets as we, we can to dig deep into the models. Um, I, I, I wanted to throw out an idea of, um, as being a, a, a facility for bringing the community together, um, I, I think what really makes sense is um, not necessarily relying on the DTC to do everything, but instead for the DTC to work to bring the community together so that um, various tools um, can be shared, um, capabilities can be shared. So working with people who are the experts on the field program data, not, not the DTC basically going out and grabbing the field program data, instead working with them to figure out what field program data makes the most sense for us to work with, you know, being able to have the community engage with that. Um, you know, they might develop the readers that need to be, you know, but then that gets incorporated into something that can be shared with the broader community. So um, not just looking for the DTC to develop all of those things, but instead being a way to facilitate sharing all of those capabilities. So I see Israel, you have your hand up. Yeah, I had a question, I guess. A little different topic, uh, but some something that Dave presented. I, I was interested by your kind of idea of how maybe the stages would would play in DTC's role there. Um, question I have is where where do you see the end users? So obviously, I have a unique perspective. Where do the forecasters fit in? Because a lot of times to provide feedback, we're we're not in there till that last stage, and at that point, it's already too late. And so we give that feedback and then it's the next version. It's it's all we're always promised it's the next version that will have the fixes in. I feel like if we were integrated, the forecasters and end users were integrated earlier, we would catch a lot of those issues earlier in the process. So I'm just curious on your thoughts there. So my that's why I think we really need to have an experimental operational model, Israel. Is that you know we we have HerX and what's great is that we get feedback from you the SUs you know the different folks in the weather service about what they see what they what they don't see and that okay so we don't get everything necessarily addressed before it becomes up that version becomes operational but it's a starting spot you know and we've also more than once figured out when we make a change we think all of our retros have actually looked good but when we run it operationally like in a day-by-day -day mode, then we realize this actually has detrimental impacts. And so I really think that there is a strong need to have uh, basically whatever the GFS next version is that is running in a quasi-operational mode in parallel, where we can actually put these implementations, these advances into them and test them for a while. Um, I, 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 that's one thought. Yeah, Hendrik. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so Israel, this is exactly why we uh, did a little revolution in how we deal with the software. I mean, previously, if you would have somebody at the Spring Experiment from a university that wanted to work with a code, they could go to uh, to uh, NCO and pick up a tarball of an undocumented piece of software of a two-year-old implemented system, right? Uh, the Short Range Weather app uh, that was uh, uh, formally released uh, early this year and where we had the... Um, the first workshop last week. Uh, this is a software package of uh, that underlies the code that we are intending to implement in 2024. So you suddenly have access for your researchers to look at codes that are five years earlier in the cycle than they used to be. And so I would hope that people like your like your uh, your collaborators uh, in Oklahoma and other universities. Would start start providing your real time uh, uh, results with uh, these kind of models during your things like your your spring experiment, and uh, I believe that uh, if we do that the right way, and if we do that with um, with having your researchers being able to uh, 
to work with much more uh, modern code, having much earlier eyes on that, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, that will accelerate how fast things go into operation too, if we do that with the same code base, but on a much earlier stage in the process than we doing, have been doing in, in, in the past. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just follow up real quick. Um, yeah, I agree with that. And, and Dave, as he mentioned, the GSL process for having something running year-round experimentally has, has been very successful, in my opinion. And and our collaborators do run early versions of FV3 at CAM scales. And so we have been looking at that. I think so at, at the convection line scale, I think we've been pretty successful in that. I think the bigger issue has been at the global scale um, and, and getting those models, getting feedback to the developers on those models at earlier stages. I think at the CAM scale, we've done a pretty good job of that in the last decade. Yeah, and, and but, but a lot of the advantage of the CAM scale is because uh, uh, on the CAM scale, with uh, at least with the H4 originally, uh, my view at least is, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not the SME on that part, but there's been a lot of attention on the, on the physics and the balance of the physics uh, whereas on the global side, we were needing in, the, in in a need mode the last decade to replace our architecture and an underlying model. So we looked much more at the uh, the uh, dynamic core. And only the last year or two, uh, we've been able to start switching back to looking at the physics. And if you look at that, uh, the fact that in what was it March, we had a week that we actually beat for a full week uh, the uh, the European model. Yeah. Of course, just only one week. But the fact that we actually did that tells me that that the fact that we switched our our uh, our uh, uh, focus to the physics of the global model is is where the real bread, the real uh, the real potential benefit is with uh, in general and with collaborating with the community too. Becky, you have your hand raised. Yes, thanks. Um, this kind of speaks back to, to your comment, Louisa. Has, has have you, there been any consideration given to making Met Plus maybe more of an open source or, or explicitly um, soliciting community input, particularly for, say, reading in different data sets, things like that? Tara, how about it? Uh, I mean, Met Plus is open source, and we are more than willing to take contributions from the community. Um, we have, uh, at least for Met Plus, for the Python side of things right now, we have a developer's guide, or actually it's a contributor's guide um, rather than a developer's guide. We don't have that for the C++ um, aspect of things. Um, but as far as, um, you know, data readers and that kind of stuff, uh, we would um, be very happy if people would um, provide um, you know, uh, their versions of, of data readers and so forth. But once again, co complying with our um, our coding standards, PEP8, you know, that kind of stuff. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. And, and I will just throw out an advertisement. We have, through our visitor program, uh, engaged with folks who were coming in and adding capabilities to MET Plus. Um, MET, MET Plus, you know, whatever part of the the package. Um, so that's definitely something that is welcome. Um, we do like to have those contributions from the community at large. Bob? Yeah, so as the kind of scope of what we can skillfully forecast or are trying to skillfully forecast is expanding in terms of, of time scales, um, and we're seeing this, for instance, with, with some of the shifts in the emphasis of activities of the UFS. Do you see the um, testing and evaluation at DTC having either capabilities that you would like to be developing or are actively working on specifically to try to expand the range of physical processes that become important as we look at, at somewhat longer timescales? Or do you see kind of you have your kind of area of, of expertise and excellence that's really focused on kind of the same same time scales that you're you're having a lot of success in today so i i would say um that the opportunity to e expand would would be um would be welcome because i i think we do want to look at things across you know all these we want an earth system that's going to model all these different behaviors. So, you know, you just focus on one area, then I, th I think you're maybe a little too narrow sighted. Um, at the same time, I would say that um, 
we we would not want to be like redeveloping the wheel for <laughs> everything. So you know, as as we try and bring this community together, that's going to span this broader range. Um, that I'm I'm sure there's um, existing tools out there that we could hopefully bring the community together so that we're all applying the same tools. Because then I think we're talking the same language and we can trust. There's that that building that trust that we're all talking about the same thing. Even if we're evaluating across different modeling systems, that you might be, you, you know, those modeling systems have different approaches. I think you can learn a lot from the stab, standpoint of having common tools um, across different partners and, and, and different modeling systems. Does that answer your question, Bob? Partly. Um, let me try asking you a different way. Are there natural extensions, for instance, of MetPlus that you have envisioned or are already planning on to try to to kind of expand the the, the scales, um, the the temporal scales in particular, the lead time scales, um, that are already underway, or or things that you think would be worth pursuing. So, Tara or Keith, do you guys want to take that question? Uh, yeah, so I mean, right now, MEP Plus has been applied to everything from, you know, five to 10 minute um, uh, model simulations to uh, multi-decadal simulations. I, uh, several years ago, we had to modify how we were handling, um, you know, the timestamp information to be able to handle uh, output from the CESM. Um, I would say that MEP Plus hasn't been exercised quite as, as much as um, we would like it to be for sub-seasonal to multi-decadal climate. Um, we have, uh, you know, a few activities um, focused on that. We, we actually have several projects focused on S2S at this time, and we are finding the, the deficiencies in MET Plus um, for that. Um, and then as, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, some of the, the, the um, development needs that we have right now, um, that we're starting to, to dig into is being able to um, provide evaluation on, on native model um, uh, domains, projections. We don't have that right now. Once we do have that capability and once it, it we can get it to be, um, uh, you know, fast enough to be run in line, um, you know, for example, with a, a climate model or, or an S2S type of, of scenario. Um, I think that that will definitely um, serve the entire community well. It's just that that's it, it, we we've um, found some patchwork ways to to um, address that issue, but um, to go back and and um, and refactor Met to handle it in a in a more streamlined manner would um, would require a, a much more concerted effort. So I think that that's one area that we we do have um, a, a need for. Um, and and in in doing so, then that does open up, um, you know, the ability to read in um, model uh, projections that are non-standard to atmosphere, such as the tripolar grid for oceans, or you know, um, some of the the different projections for space weather um, applications and so forth. Uh, you know, we've certainly seen a lot of it, um, and and once again, we've we've use Python embedding to address those issues. I just don't know that that's necessarily going to be the, the optimal solution, but it, it at least addresses it um, enough to get us started right now. Great, thank you. Yeah. Mike? Yeah, Tara, maybe, maybe you also wanted to com comment on the fact, because I know we've discussed the model diagnostic task force diagnostics and how those could be leveraged uh, in, in some manner to Matt Plus. So maybe um, Rob is interested in, in that as well, because I know there's there's a lot of stuff out there and we don't want to reinvent anything. So Right. Um, yeah, so there, as you said, um, Mike, the Model Diagnostic Task Force um, code, which is, um, you know, written in, in Python, um, we see that there's a, um, hopefully a natural, um, you know, uh, Synergy between Met Plus with the Python embedding um, and the task force um, uh, uh, diagnostics. Um, also, there, there actually that is one other major development um, issue that we would like to to take on is um, while we can have the the Met code base, um, you know, call a Python script um, to to be able to provide input. 
right now there is no way for a Python script to be able to call um, you know, um, an aspect of, of the mode capability. For example, um, mo um, uh, it, excuse me, um, of MET capabilities. So for example, um, at NSSL, they have different ways that they like to do the, um, the um, identification of objects, but they really then also want to be able to just use the, the engine of mode to do the matching and um, compute all of the different attributes and so forth. Um, we don't have that, um, that uh, ability to, to let a Python script call a MET um, uh, algorithm and, and you know, pass information back into Python. So we may see that when we're trying to, um, to uh, merge with um, tools like MTDF um, or Monet, which is, uh, and actually now it's Melody's Monet um, for uh, atmosphere composition. Um, or you know other um, uh, aspects of a of a coupled model system. Um, once again, we have a, um, a proposal that we're working on right now um, for a project to try and bring MTDF and and Met Plus together. Whether it gets funded, um, you know, in this in this proposal cycle, we'll see. If not, and when I say we, um, it, this, this isn't under DTC. This is non DTC. Um, uh, proposals, but we're we're reaching outside of our um, you know just what is provided through DC, DTC funding to to make this to make Met Plus become the um, the package that it needs to be in order to evaluate coupled modeled systems. Are you going to make me talk again, Mike? No, if Louisa gives me one more minute, I just want to say one more thing. Um, say one more thing, and then I do want to make sure I open it up to the SAB oh, members that we have sorry, not heard from yet. Sorry. So. I'll just say we've heard um, well-tuned uh, physics suite an awful lot. Um, uh, Ricky Rude likes to call it a well-calibrated. And I, I always think of that as a short-term solution because we ultimately want to have something well-tuned, calibrated, so we can get the right answers, you know, um, NWP-wise and so on, so we don't get yelled at. So. Be really careful when you're thinking of a well-tuned physics suite because that may have lots of compensating errors in it. So that goes back down to process level. Okay, that's all I have. Having, having said that, Mike, uh, it, it is our job to get the best possible answer today to the, to the US community. So we have to find a balance between the two. Because oh, absolutely. Well that's my part about, but we'll get yelled at if we don't do some of these practical things on the short term. Yeah, absolutely. But that's what I said a little earlier too. Short short term is all about uh, calibrating. Long term uh, is all about doing the right thing for the right reason. Chris? I think you're on mute, Chris. My fault. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So this is a general question about um, uh, Met and how it scales to perform in the cloud when you get larger and larger data sets. Is there a containerized version of Met or any of its um, like Met Plus? I was just curious because I know in the past there have been some issues with doing stat analysis when you have large data sets that you're accumulating. Tara, I'll let you take that. I'm actually going to um, uh, maybe try and throw it to John Ali Gatway if he's, uh, if he's um, able to come off mute and, and address it because he's done a lot more work with um, Met Plus in the cloud and so forth. So uh, yeah, this is John. So I just just got on the call a minute ago. Um, so good timing, Chris. Uh, uh, yes, we do have a containerized version. Uh, actually, all of our, um, well, we, we have multiple containerized versions of the MET software itself, but then also of the, of the MET Plus wrappers built on top of the MET uh, components. And they're available in Docker Hub. Uh, and um, and there's, there's information about the, on the website about that. In regards to this, that analysis uh, issue, so we actually recently did some testing with uh, Lindsay Blank, who who used to work at the DTC, but has moved on to another to a to a, another company. Uh, but she's using stat analysis there, and we identified some uh, opportunities for reducing the memory consumption and making it run a lot more efficiently. Um, so 
it, it's possible that the, the challenges you ran into in the past will be solved by this work. And uh, Seth Linden, one of the one of the engineers working on our team, uh, is is working on that uh, the the changes that would would, would help in that regard. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Yes, thank you very much, John. Or did you have something to add to that before I go to Julio? I do, and, and it'll be really quick. Um, I also wanted to point out that in our um, in our uh, collaboration with uh, the Met Office through um, an NCAR project, uh, the Met Office is actually um, starting to look at optimizing many of the tools that um, are more of the memory hog type of tools, such as series analysis, ensemble stat, um, grid stat, and so forth. Um, and so that is one way that the Met Office is contributing back to um, Met Plus is, is trying to help us um, in that area and trying to, to um, identify ways to optimize. So we're, we, we are aware that we need to continue to try and make things um, move more, uh, uh, process more quickly. Thank you very much, Tara. Appreciate it. Julio? Yeah, hi. I, I um, don't have anything really deep to say here. I, I, I just wanted to, you know, respond to some of the things Michael and Hendrick were saying. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of time and space between when somebody in the community starts to look, you know, look at processes or looking to contribute to uh, uh, GFS or UFS and the time anything gets into uh, anything remotely operational, even in, you know, even in climate modeling where our standards are, I'd say, less, well, less objective. There's there's a there's you know there's a lot of there's a lot of time and development, and you know collaboration that happens between the initial stages of somebody trying to you know put something in a model and getting anywhere close. I, so, I think that's a that's a really good point, and and I think that's one of the reasons why. Um, the DTC has been trying to work with our external management um, and, and why we've been getting recommendations from our science advisory board over the years that we need to have a, a little more freedom to have longer term projects when we just have a project that says, OK, we're going to look at this one thing for one year and then we're going to move on to something else. Um, that doesn't really there needs to be this evolution. We need to be able to work with developers. Things need to evolve. Um, it's not a one through one out sort of thing. Um, and so how, how we get to an environment where that kind of thing can happen more, um, that things can gradually mature and, and percolate to the top um, is, is something that uh, we, ha we definitely haven't perfected yet um, and are definitely looking for ways to uh, um, better set up that process. Is there, so, we just have a few minutes left in this session because um, I don't want to eat too much into um, the SAB's break and then their time to have their own um, standalone discussion. But I, I do, if there's any pressing questions from the Science Advisory Board before the DTC folks um, drop off, I uh, want to give you that opportunity. And sharing thoughts. I didn't want to. I didn't mean to stymie any of the discussion. <laughs> Lisa. Yes. Hi. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on on the discussion has been going on, and I'm trying to sort them out in my head. For sort of one one view is from a developer's point of view, as I'm working on some development for the for the UFS and. Um, I agree with this notion of hypothesis uh, testing. Why are you developing something? And for instance, in this work with uh, this enhanced convective organization scheme, uh, we did work closely with the uh, George Kiladi's group and their sort of subject matter experts in tropical variability and wave propagate, propagation and um, convectively coupled wave um, studies uh, so you know we we had a hypothesis of this enhanced organization could better couple with waves and then we had they had ways to to look at that through 
different frequency wave number spectra or uh, wave propagating plots. And I think some of that translated into to MET plus or is going to be translated in, but I think that was a nice way of working iteratively. Uh, and I, th I think maybe if, if that would somehow be on DTC's plates, it, it would be nice to, I suppose, both have the tools, but also the subject matter expertise to interpret what, what, what is the meaning of, of all this. And I think that's a, an important factor to have that, uh, to be able to, to, you know, see the ways you can look at things uh, and how, what is the expected outcome, you know? So I think maybe that uh, is sort of one, one way I'm thinking about that particular development and how it sort of entered into the UFS. And then from a UFS R2 project co-lead standpoint, I've been following this discussion, um, you know, with CCPP and physics schemes being um, added from the community into CCPP, but then they have to make it up the or down the <laughs> funnel down to operations. And I think there's a little bit of a mismatch in, in the R2 project. There is sort of funded, there's a plan. There's a project plan, there's a test plan, and there's funded projects. There's a little bit of a mismatch how a new scheme uh, is going to make that transition, uh, a mismatch in the plan. And maybe um, there could be room for improvement there in the next coming years, I think. But when, it, when you talk about this sort of well-tuned suite or well-integrated physics suite, I, I have to disagree with Micah, but I think it's sort of the key role of the RTO project is really to, to take all the available, say we have five PBL schemes uh, in CCPP and we have five deconvection schemes and three microphysics schemes. How do we choose which path to go? And I think the key job from the RTO project's point of view is to make sure we have an, a well-integrated suite uh, that is not connected and, and put together as an afterthought, but rather uh, with a purpose. And I think an example, for instance, is uh, in the PBL scheme, there's a mass flux computation. There's also a mass flux computation in the shallow convection scheme and a deep convection scheme. This gives double counting, and it's simply because we have just put together three schemes that are essentially doing the same thing. And I think if we could, with some purpose, correct that, uh, make them work together and say, this is the suite that we have decided to work for operations, then uh, we have achieved something, uh, something really good. And okay, so I have one last thought, and that sort of some some practical considerations for DTCs to sort of engage in this R2 uh, process. And I think one one thing uh, I think I heard to come up that is a little bit of disconnect with the the global model uh, and the feedback and. I think from what we have seen from on Wednesday mornings, there is this uh, coupled model uh, development meeting. It's hosted by Avishal Mera and Jessica Meister. It's been really um, a nice way of discussing, you know, results, feedback to the developers, and you, you bring it back. And I sort of miss a little bit of DTC's presence in those meetings, because I think that there's a, a little disconnect there. And then also if DTC could have some capability of doing model runs themselves, um, CPU power, I think um, that could be a nice priority. If, uh, so it's not always this dependency that someone else gonna have to make the runs or someone else gonna have to provide input for evaluation, but they can rather run experiments uh, on their own. So those are just some thoughts. Thanks, Lisa. And, and, and there are, there are projects where we have been running our own. It, it's just we have limit. It, it's that whole HPC constraint business across the whole spectrum. Um, so yeah. we, we do like to be able to run some of our own experiments also. I think it's just been a little bit of a practical hurdle for, for this uh, uh, process to work smoothly because it's just mm -hmm. been, um, you know, asking someone else to do a run and then everybody is busy and constrained and i think maybe that could open up some opportunity and yeah i think our i think our team would agree um it's just how how we get all those pieces to fit together and how we make sure everybody has the resources that they need 
um, it, it doesn't always work fluidly. So yeah. thanks for all those thoughts. Hendrick, did you have a, a quick comment or? Well, j just want to wanna voice my appreciation for Lisa's thoughts and uh, at least some of these in terms of kind of uh, getting this whole process a little bit more integrated is one of the reasons why we are uh, focusing on on, on uh, describing and developing this whole UFS I2O uh, process a little better. And uh, I'm not Mike Eck, although I start looking more like him every day. Uh, but uh, the subtlety is that uh, is not that necessarily the suite of models is well tuned, but that we get skill out of the that we get quite a bit of skill out of tuning rather than out of physical improvements. And uh, and uh, this that is uh, something that that we've, we uh, we we just need to find a balance for these things, because on the one side. If I look at me as a weather service operational guy needing to provide the best forecast, I can I cannot uh, say uh, this is a, if I have a cheap way of improving the forecast for the day, I cannot justify not doing that. Uh, but having said that, uh, especially in the AI world, uh, there are uh, things like genetic optimization techniques and other things that we could tentatively build into a hierarchical testing framework that would allow us to automate some of these things automatically inside of the hierarchical training framework. Uh, framework. Uh, that is something that I think we haven't looked at yet at all. And so there, there are, of course, AI machine learning are very hot button item and, 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 and the buzzwords, but we have done a few, I've seen a few experiments where, where people used more of a genetic optimization approach that they could do the an objective optimization much, much, much faster, particularly if you have a hierarchical system with lower to, to higher to higher resolution models. And so uh, just some additional thoughts. I, I really appreciate you, your, your general thoughts about the problems of working together and, and not having these different stove pipes. And just on Avichal and Jessica's uh, stuff, uh, Historically, the, the DTC was really focused on the convection allowing um, uh, uh, regional models. And only very recently has there some global modeling testbed money gone uh, to the DTC. So the fact that these two, uh, that, have, that effort and what the DTC is doing are a little bit more disjointed has a clear historical reason, but something we can work on. Yeah. Yeah, I just think that that is one sort of uh, obvious opportunity where I think uh, the DTC and, and the rest of the couple model development teams could uh, engage a little bit better. Okay. Yep, well said. Mian, I saw your hand raised, but then you put it down. Did you have something you wanted to say? Go um, ahead. Yeah, uh, basically, I just have a comment. I, I thought I could um, discuss that maybe tomorrow or something, uh, because I, I heard so much about um, the model, the tools and the stuff. But there's a, nothing I heard today is about uh, anything about atmospheric composition in those model forecasts or evaluation. I just wonder about the DTC overall goal. Uh, is that the weather without uh, uh, atmospheric constituents or 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 the like aerosol trace gas uh, or their feedback to the weather and the climate would it be a part of the DTC um, goal um, and move forward. Hendrik, do you have a response? Uh, yeah. So uh, so we are so the, so the the two um, pieces of the puzzle in terms of coupled modeling that are. Uh, having the, the most issues in terms of architecture in general still are the atmospheric composition and the land modeling. and uh, But uh, we are moving forward with both of them uh, to get them better integrated into the UFS. And actually, I, I have to look at my notes, whether it's the GFS or the GEFS, the last operational implementation has, uh, I, I believe it's the control member of the GEFS, uh, has a atmospheric composition component uh, coupled into it as well as a wave component. So we're definitely moving that way. 
Um, yeah, I can confirm that. So GAPS has one member that that output a composition. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would say right now we've been limited because we've had so much of our work going into supporting software that we haven't gotten to expand into um, those areas yet. Um, but I will say that, Mian, because you are on the Science Advisory Board, <laughs> that our external partners are envisioning that we would expand out into that that area or at least be cognizant of that area because they they specifically wanted to get uh folks who are are specialized have expertise are subject matter experts in that in that area to be providing us with advice going forward did that answer your question yes okay thanks thank you all right um Welcome back, Christian. <laughs> so um, we've gone a little over, but this has been great. I, I love all the discussion, um, but I do want to um, make sure that we don't um, go too far over into the time for the Science Advisory Board members to start their internal discussion. Um, and by all means, you know, as, as you discussed today, um, so what I'm going to ask is that so you guys can take a break um a little break to get out of your chairs and take care of whatever business you need to um and you know maybe maybe come back at five after the hour um and um i would like all of the dtc folks besides jenny to um drop off the google meet and you will you are done for the day um the dtc folks not the sav <laughs> um and um but i will be available if you need me to pop back in if there's some big questions you need to ask me um or you can also put um some questions in the slack um that we can we will be able to see and and i will i will continue to try and monitor those and if there's a question you have specifically for somebody on our staff just go ahead and tag them um in in your um posting on the Slack channel and they should get notified um, to go look at it and, and provide feedback to you. So is there, bef before I, I drop off, is there um, any questions from the Science Advisory Board? Um, yeah, yeah, Louisa, if we had a question, which channel would we put our, which Slack channel would we put our questions? The day one session? Yeah, that would, that would probably be the best place. Okay. And I've got it open. I'm going to, and I get, I'm, if you heard my stuff in the background, I, I have it set up so I get notifications whenever there's a, a new post. Um, so, and then you do have your SAB member private channel if you guys want to start. Um, that That is, I, I can see that one, but I, I don't, I try not to go in and look at it unless you guys send, like, ask me for something in particular from there. But the rest of the folks um, that they're not on, it's a private invite only channel. So um, any other questions? So, so uh, Louisa, I'm, I'm basically doing a guest performance here. I'm not part of the SAB. So I'm planning to drop off, but I will keep my Slack open. So if, um, if anybody of the Science Advisory Board has additional questions, you have a reasonable chance that I might come back on if you put the question in Slack. But I'm planning to get off because I'm not official member of the right. Of the so Advisory yeah, Board. so our 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 honored guests, um, they also have access to the Slack. Um, and so if you have a specific question for them, please tag them, and um, and they can come in and look at what your question is and provide feedback on that because they also indicated they're willing to help out. Um, and yeah, but but we're not we're not supposed to be on on the next part of the meeting. That's the point. No, no, yeah. So that that's right. When I said DTC, so it's it's that this next part is SAB members only. Okay. Any other any other questions from the SAB? Okay. Okay. So we'll meet back at uh, SAB members at uh, five minute past five minutes past the hour. Yeah, and I'm going to sign off in just a moment. I'm going to grab the, capture the chat, because I don't want to lose that, and I'll lose it once I drop off. <laughs> well, enjoy okay. your meeting, folks. It was nice to talk to you. Thanks. 
Louisa, I should get the chat too. It should be recorded and I can forward it to you. Oh, okay, that's great. Thanks.